Good morning. Welcome to Non-Stitch Respecting Adversaries, Practical Forgery Attacks on GCM and TCLs in the South Seas IJ Room with speakers Sean Devlin, Hanno Burke, and Aaron Zauner. Before we begin, a few brief notes. Stop by the Business Hall located in Bayside AB during the day and for the welcome reception from 5.30 to 7 o'clock tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on Level 3. Join us for Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay, B, C, D at 6.30 p.m. Thanks for putting your phone on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you wait for your voicemail to pick it up. With that, we thank you and welcome our speakers. Uh, hi guys, I'm Sean. Uh, um, yeah, I'm Hanno. Uh, so to get started, I'm gonna load up our slide deck. Uh, I don't have it with me, unfortunately, but I have a pretty good idea about how we can actually uh, uh, get it here so we can get started. I gotta say, there's about a 20% chance this will work, so. Oh, okay, it worked. <laughs> Okay, yeah. great. So, so what actually happened there is uh, we targeted a vulnerable domain and actually injected our entire slide deck into it, um, and we're just going to run the talk this way. So, <laughs> uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Hannah. Uh, can you make full screen? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, we want to talk about TLS encryption and uh, especially the symmetric part of TLS encryption. So very roughly how the TLS protocol works is that first we have some kind of key exchange and then we get a shared key between the client and the server and then we use some symmetric encryption and authentication and this second part is the one we want to look at today. Um, there were historically three ways to do this symmetric encryption. One is using the CBC mode in combination with HMAC, uh, one is RC4 and one is GCM. And there's a new one, ChaCha20 and Poly1305, uh, but this has only been standardized a couple of weeks ago, so that's not widely available yet. Um, and uh, the CBC-based modes had a number of attacks in the past years. Uh, there was uh, already in 2002 the first version of a padding oracle, and then many more attacks that uh, were similar, um, and uh, this is going on until this year we had new attacks on these modes. Uh, and there were basically uh, two design problems in these CBC modes. One is that they are using a so-called implicit initialization vector, which has been changed in TLS 1.1, but for a long time, most people didn't use TLS 1.1. Um, then in the very old SSL version 3, the content of the padding was undefined, which enabled the poodle attack. And all TLS versions use something that's uh, called MAC then encrypt, or more precisely MAC then pad and encrypt. And this allowed attacks because if an attacker can detect whether the padding is wrong or whether the MAC is wrong, that allows him to decrypt parts of the content. And there's an extension to change that to encrypt then MAC, but that's not really used in the wild. Um, and uh, I, I like to show this, uh, this quote from the TLS 1.2 standard because uh, it already kind of predicts the attacks that later happened. So it says, uh, there's this, this leaves a small timing side channel, but it is not believed to be large enough to be exploitable. And it turned out it was exploitable. That was the lucky 13 attack, which really is, uh, was a, kind of a big mess. So. Uh, there was uh, last year an attack where the Amazon had their own TLS implementation and they tried to fix this and uh, it turned out the fix didn't really work. And there are a number of implementations who just say we won't fix this because the fix is so bothersome, we'll just ignore it and try to move to the newer cipher modes. And OpenSSL, which was one of our co-authors who found this, Juraj Somorowski, uh, that with the fix for Lucky 13, OpenSSL introduced another padding oracle. 
So these whole CBC modes, while you can implement them in a secure way, it's very difficult and therefore we kind of want to get rid of them. And then there's one alternative, uh, RC4, uh, where like after Lucky 13, a lot of people switch to RC4, uh, but this has weaknesses as well. So RC4 is a stream cipher and the problem there is that it has certain biases that for certain parts of the key stream, uh, it's more likely that it's a one than a zero. And this can be attacked. It has been known for a long time, but uh, in 2013, there was the first practical attack on RC4 in TLS. And since then, there have been many improvements of these attacks. So RC4 also isn't a good alternative. And there's also now a, an RFC saying that you should just never use RC4 anymore. So this leaves us with GCM. Um, GCM stands for Galois counter mode and is usually used with AES. It is theoretically possible to use it with other ciphers, but basically nobody does that. And it's only available in TLS 1.2, which uh, turned out to be like, when these attacks were found, a lot of software didn't support TLS 1.2 yet. Um, but it, it's generally, I think, a consensus today in the cryptographic community that this is the only mode that's really safe. And here's a quote from Adam Langley from Google where he clearly states that, that like all the other modes are kind of cryptographically broken. Um, so yeah, we thought we should have a closer look at GCM because if that's everyone's moving to GCM, so how secure is that? Um, so GCM is an authenticated encryption mode, which uh, the basic idea behind that is that uh, there were a lot of vulnerabilities when people tried to combine encryption and authentication. So the idea is to have one mode that does just both things combined, standardized, and that's called an authenticated encryption mode or more precisely authenticated encryption with additional data. Um, Um, but it turns out GCM is not very popular among cryptographers. So I have a number of quotes here where Niels Ferguson commented on the GCM standard, do not use GCM, consider using one of the other modes. Uh, we, then there, there was a paper from Emilia Kasper and Peter Schwabe who they wrote a timing safe implementation of GCM and concluded that most other implementations are not timing safe. Um, Adam Langley says that uh, yeah, it so easily leads to timing side channels. He, he doesn't want to use it. Um, so um, yeah, bottom line is um, everybody uses GCM, but it seems nobody really likes it. Um, yeah. So, and I, I wondered why that's the case. And then I, I found this quote uh, also from Adam Langley, where he uh, specifically commented on GCM in TLS raises uh, that there's a potential problem that with the so-called nonce value. Um, so he said there's an eight byte value that basically the implementation has to change and to choose and uh, the only safe way to do that is to use a counter. And uh, there may be implementations that choose this at random or do something else that may not be secure. And uh, Adam Langley scanned the Alexa top uh, 200,000 and didn't find any implementations doing that. Um, so uh, what we did then is uh, we scanned the whole internet for this. Um, um, yeah. Um, so what's the issue here? So GCM needs a nonce value, uh, which stands for number used once. and. Uh, that is a requirement for the security of the algorithm. So if one uses the same nonce value twice, then uh, it's no longer a nonce, and then uh, you have uh, attacks. And the nonce value in TLS is uh, eight bytes large, and uh, as I said earlier, it's safe to use a counter. So you could just say we use a zero, and for the next encryption we use a one, and a two, and so on. Um, if you use a random value, then it's not so clear whether that's secure. So, of course, if it's random, it can randomly generate the same value again. Um, if you try to calculate how likely that is, then you need several gigabytes of data or even terabytes of data till this becomes an issue. But even though it's not ideal, like you don't want this risk even for 
connections using several gigabytes. So uh, we ended up saying, okay, if the nonce value gets just repeated, that's clearly a security vulnerability. If the nonce value is chosen at random, we say, okay, that's still kind of a low risk security vulnerability. Um, and this is what the TLS specification says about this nonce value. Um, so it tells the implementer of a TLS library, each value of the nonce must be distinct for each invocation of the encryption. Um, but it doesn't really tell how to do that. So what I just told you that just use a counter and that's secure, uh, that's not written down in the spec and it's not written down that a random value may be risky. It says, however, that you may use the sequence number from the TLS record, um, which is a reasonable recommendation and it's kind of unclear why they didn't say this is simply a must because then these issues wouldn't happen. And then you could just skip sending the nonce because the, the TLS record number, the implementation already knows. Um, so yeah, so we scanned the internet for this issue. Um, we wrote a little patch to OpenSSL that it would um, that it would write that it would print the nonce value of a connection, and we found uh, a bit less than 200 hosts that had a repeating nonce just by doing 10 connections, and we found uh, around uh, 70,000 hosts with a random nonce. Um, and yeah, then the, the next job was trying to track down which devices are responsible for this. So we had a bunch of information that we could look at. We had the certificate information, we had the, the website, uh, and we could look at the HTTP server header. Uh, a problem with that is that quite often you see a server header, but it's not really the device you're talking to because there may be a server and there's a load balancer in front of it and the load balancer is doing the TLS termination and you have no way of knowing which kind of device that is. And trying to contact people saying, hey, your website has a security issue that by experience hardly works. So people just don't answer emails if you tell them about security issues. So what we ended up doing is trying to find like vulnerable hosts where we kind of knew someone who may know someone at this company and thereby we were able to track down a few of them. Um, so then uh, for the random looking values, uh, uh, a lot of them seem to come from checkpoint based on their server header, uh, but it turns out they, these values were not really random. So uh, checkpoint then told us that they are using a linear feedback shift register, which also goes through the whole space of the 64 bit nonce. So it's equally secure as a counter. But this was a bit surprising and it was also, then we had to adapt our scanning tools that they would like not, they, they would filter out these LFSR values. Um, then for the duplicate nonces that are the severe security vulnerability, we were able to identify two vendors. Uh, one is devices from Redware, uh, which use a chip from Cavium. Um, and they have received an update now. Um, and there are several pages from Visa Europe. Um, Visa didn't answer our initial emails, but then us Technica wrote about it and then they contacted us. Um, but we have not disclosed the vendor yet because we're still kind of in the process with them to, uh, for the disclosure process. Um, yeah, and the devices with random nonces, uh, a lot of them came from A10, and uh, some of them were IBM Lotus Domino, and both vendors published updates. So you, if you have one of these, you probably want to install an update. And also a lot of them came from a company called Sangfor. Uh, it's from China, and they seem to produce like cheap uh, DSL routers and things like that, but we got no response from them. Um, uh, but based on the data we see, we, we're pretty convinced that there are more devices out there that have this vulnerability. Um, so we recommend if, if you're doing testing of TLS devices or if you're a pen tester that you kind of have this on your radar and look out for this. Um, yeah. Um, and this was something that, that uh, I, I spent a bit of time trying to understand what's going on here. 
uh, this was a scene with the Radware device, but also with another device where I had a phone call with the owners of this device and they told me a vendor name, but I wasn't really sure if that was a reliable information. And we're seeing here that there are two values and they look like uninitialized memory. And um, I, I got the information that this may be an OpenSSL uh, 101J. And I looked into that code and found, okay, well, uh, this non, so what OpenSSL does, it, it's, it uses a counter, but it starts with a random value. And uh, this code here um, is not checking whether the random, value, random number generator is failing. So what I assume that's happening here is that um, they use maybe some kind of hardware random number generator that sometimes produces failures and then returns an error and OpenSSL is not properly checking for this. Um, this has been fixed earlier last year, but OpenSSL back then did not consider it as a security issue. Um, and if I if I change this code to return this error, um, then I, I could see a similar behavior, but not the same behavior. I saw it sending out these two identical nonces, which uh, looked very similar to the values we had on the slide before, but then the connection terminated due to some kind of error. So uh, it's not entirely sure what's going on there, but there we kind of tried to track down why that was the case. Um, okay, and now I turn over to Sean for the attack description. Yeah, so, so we've been hearing a lot about GCM, how it uh, requires a nonce, a unique nonce for safe usage. Um, so we're going to dig a little bit into why that is. Um, so during the, the NIST standardization process of GCM, uh, they requested comments from you know, a bunch of different cryptographers. We saw some comments from Niels Ferguson earlier basically saying, don't use GCM. Um, another set of comments came from Antoine Zhu. Um, and he basically uh, showed how uh, in the case of nonce reuse under GCM, uh, it's a catastrophic failure that allows the attacker to forge messages arbitrarily. And uh, since the encryption component of GCM is you know, just a stream cipher mode, essentially, the attacker can uh, modify messages with high granularity. Um, so we're gonna dig in, into a little bit of the specifics here. Um, so a, a little bit of background on GCM. Um, as Hannah was saying earlier, GCM is a mode that's uh, basically par parametrized by a block cipher. So most people use AES. Um, and the user's inputs to, uh, to an instance of GCM is basically gonna be uh, K, this encryption key. Um, now of interest to us is a derived value H. Uh, H is going to be basically the authentication subkey that is going to be used to protect messages from forgeries. Now, H is not a user input. H is a derived value that we get by basically using our encryption, encryption key to uh, encrypt a block of zeros under the block cipher. So just keep in mind that H is going to be our target. That's where we're trying to get back. And then, uh, at the per encryption level, the user's other input is gonna be this nonce. We need to remember that's a value that we want never to repeat. Um, so GCM authentication, how does that work? Uh, well, the high level view is basically, uh, actually, so if you go actually look at a, an implementation of GCM, what you're actually gonna see is a bunch of you know, XOR operations and ta table lookups and stuff like that. But what's going on at the high level, um, conceptually, is we're gonna sort of format our message as a polynomial, which I'll get into a little bit how that works in a second here. Um, we're going to uh, sort of mask the polynomial with uh, a derived value from the nonce. Uh, this is basically gonna be a product of the, our encryption key and the per encryption nonce. So, the same way we got H by encrypting a block of zeros, we're gonna get this mask by encrypting the nonce, essentially. Um, so once we have this polynomial, we're gonna you know, plug in H, and then we're gonna evaluate it, and the output is gonna be our authentication tag. Um, so that's kind of the, 
the high level view of the algorithm. The high level attacker's view is gonna take advantage of this polynomial structure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to tweak that polynomial uh, so we can find a polynomial, polynomial that has H as a root. Then we're gonna factor that polynomial, which you know, fortunately we have very efficient algorithms for factoring polynomials uh, in the domain that we're working in here. And once we factor it, we'll have the roots of the polynomial, and H is guaranteed to be one of those roots. Um, typically, the, the, the number of roots is gonna be uh, pretty short. Um, it's, it somewhat varies with message length. If you have a very long message, you could have a lot of roots. Um, but a lot of the messages we're gonna be dealing with are gonna be pretty short, and so we're gonna expect only to find a few most of the time. Okay, so let's get a, a little bit lower level here. So uh, for concreteness, let's just consider a message that has uh, no additional authenticated data. Uh, recall that GCM is an AEAD mode, so you can authenticate additional data past the plain text, and, or the ciphertext, rather. Um, so we'll consider a message that has no authenticated data and one block of ciphertext. So if we were to uh, format that as a polynomial, as I was saying earlier, so basically our, our one block of ciphertext, that's gonna be C sub one there, that's gonna be the coefficient of uh, X squared. Um, next to that we have uh, this coefficient L and that's gonna be basically just a, another 128-bit block that encodes the message length. That, so that's gonna encode both the length of the ciphertext and the length of the authenticated data. And then the constant coefficient we're gonna get just by that nonce derived value that we're gonna to use to mask the polynomial. So recall that that's just gonna be the encryption of the nonce. Um, I got that highlighted in red there to emphasize the fact that this is a secret value so that the attacker doesn't know what the mask is. That's gonna be important uh, in, a, in a little bit here. And so once we have this polynomial, uh, we just plug in H. And so we have F of H equals T and that's gonna be our authentication tag. So the receiver is gonna uh, repeat the same process, compare what he gets with uh, the tag uh, the sender gives him, and if they match, then it's gonna be an authentic message. Okay, so uh, the attacker is gonna use some algebra to kind of fiddle with this polynomial and uh, get to a, a place that's a little bit more advantageous. So the attacker you know, can see messages on the wire, so um, most of the values we're gonna be working with here are public. The ciphertext is public, um, the length of the message is gonna be public, obviously, and uh, the authentication tag is gonna be public, so the, the attacker can pull these things off the wire. Um, the mask is still gonna be secret, but everything else we have. So we're gonna take our polynomial F and we're gonna tweak it a little bit by subtracting the authentication tag. Now what that's gonna give us, uh, recall that we had F of H uh, equals T, so our new polynomial F prime of H, since we've subtracted T, is gonna be zero. So what that means is that H is going to be uh, a root of F prime. Um, and recall that we have efficient algorithms for finding the roots of a polynomial. Now the problem here is that uh, the attacker doesn't know F prime. Um, conceptually we know that they're, you know, what it looks like, but we don't actually know what this mask value is. So this is where nonce reuse is gonna come in. So suppose we have two different messages encrypted under the same nonce here. So I've got those listed as F sub one prime and F sub two prime. Um, so there, we're gonna you know, stick with our uh, example of uh, one block messages. So we have um, one block of ciphertext there and then the length values um, and then two different authentication tags. Um, but the key thing to recognize here is that uh, the per encryption mask that we generate with the key and the nonce is gonna be the same in both polynomials. So what we can do then is we can use these two, we can combine them together, uh, basically subtract one from the other uh, to eliminate that term entirely. And what we're left with is gonna be uh, this new polynomial uh, I've called G here at the bottom. And uh, you know, as you can see, the, the mask value has been kind of erased, and now we are left with like a fully known polynomial. Um, 
And since you know, both of the polynomials we started with had uh, h as a root, our new polynomial g also has h as a root. So now we have a fully known polynomial and it has h as a root and we can just simply factor this to get a list of candidates for the authentication key. Um, so the question is how do, I, how do I apply this in the TLS setting? So we basically went with the model of uh, going after uh, content injection basically against the client side. So that's what we saw at the beginning of this talk when we basically man in the middle of ourselves to inject this slide deck into uh, a vulnerable domain. Um, so basically the outline for our attack is first of all, uh, the user's gonna visit some attacker controlled content. Um, this might be, uh, you know, for example, the, the attacker might uh, inject malicious content into an, an unauthenticated page that the user is visiting. Um, so once the user is at that attacker controlled content, the attacker is basically gonna use JavaScript and they're going to initiate a TLS connection with the vulnerable server and basically start polling it and uh, you know, monitoring the traffic that comes back. So the attacker is gonna be basically watching all the encrypted TLS records that come back. They're gonna collect the responses and they're gonna you know, basically build a dictionary by nonce. So uh, recall as Hannah was saying in TLS, we kind of have this, uh, this eight byte nonce that is uh, again a public value and transmitted over the wire. Um, and so the attacker is basically just gonna collect these along with the messages that they go with. And what they're gonna be doing is uh, looking for a collision in nonces. And so when the server repeats a nonce, the attacker is basically just going to execute Zhu's attack that uh, we just discussed and that's gonna give them a short list of candidates for the authentication key. Um, now in this step, uh, it's important to note that uh, as I was saying earlier, you might get more than one candidate back. Um, in some of the vulnerable hosts that we saw, this turned out not to be a big problem because uh, you know, they went to repeating the same nonce over and over again. So what we could do is you know, just wait for the next message, repeat the attack again, and eventually we're gonna whittle down our list of candidates to just one. Um, at that point, when we, ha when we have the authentication key, we're gonna use, the attacker's gonna use his controlled content to redirect the user to a known resource. Um, so that might just be a, a, a static web page or even something like CSS or JavaScript that's uh, served from the target domain. Um, and what the attacker is gonna do when he sees the response for that coming back is he's gonna tamper with the message and replace it with uh, one of his choosing. Um, so re recall that GCM uses uh, stream cipher for the encryption component basically. Uh, so this allows him to uh, tamper with very high precision basically on a byte by byte basis. Um, so as long as the attacker knows what the message is, he can replace it with any message that he wants essentially. Um, so this is kind of showing a, I'm not sure if that's too, uh, let me zoom in a bit here. So this is basically the, the known resource we requested from this vulnerable domain. So actually this domain that we targeted uh, basically just redirects everything to a, a different domain. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, not really in use anymore it seems like. So, so basically the response that we get back is gonna be a, a 301 move permanently. And it has uh, you know, a known piece of HTML. So um, in theory we could replace that entire uh, message, but there are some parts that are kind of variable. So there's the, you know, the date and the expires timestamp. Um, it'd be a little bit tough to, to be certain that we're, we're placing those correctly. So we chose to go with a, a more surgical approach where um, we basically are gonna change the, the uh, HTT, HTTP response from 301 to 200 okay. Um, and we're gonna kind of mess with the, the next few headers just to make sure that we don't, uh, just to make sure it's a valid HTTP response. And then we replace the body of the, the response with a block of HTML that's basically gonna load our slides from uh, a domain we control. Um, so uh, I'd like to show that process one more time. We can 
kind of talk through it a little bit more. Um, okay, so this is basically a video of the same kind of attack here. We're gonna be attacking the same domain. Um, so you, you can see here uh, the first couple of messages that come up. Um, it says found nonce, you know, we have a random looking value, and then found nonce, we have this block of zeros. So what's ha happening here is we're basically just reporting on the responses that are coming back. We're saying these are the nonces that we found here. And we're gonna be looking for a collision. And so when we get the next message, uh, you can see that we, we got the same nonce again. We got another block of zeros. And so that gives us a collision. We go ahead and run uh, the factoring attack to recover some candidates for the key. You can see in this case that we actually have three candidates. So you know we're not sure what to do exactly at this point. So we're just gonna wait and collect another message. And then when we get that next message, um, it's again gonna be a block of zeros, and so we again perform the attack, and then that's gonna give us some more candidates, um, but we can just take the intersection of the first set and the second set, and um, with very high probability, there's, there's just gonna be one remaining. And so at this point, we have uh, you know, one candidate for the key left, and that's gonna be the correct value. So we're gonna go ahead and inject, and we you know, put this little GIF in there. Um, um, yeah, and so that, that's basically our, uh, our attack on TLS. Um, so uh, looking forward to the future, there are a couple, uh, there are a couple sort of bigger trends that are gonna be mitigations against this kind of problem. One is at the protocol level uh, in TLS, so uh, Recently, Hanno was, was saying uh, the uh, a new AEAD, Cha Cha Twenty Poly Thirteen O Five, has gone through the you know the draft process and is being adopted now. So uh, Cha Cha Poly, uh, instead of this explicit nonce construction, uses uh, the same thing that TLS One Point Three is going to be using in the future, which is instead of transmitting the nonce over the wire. Uh, it's kind of baked in to use the sequence number uh, of each record. So uh, any, any implementation that doesn't conform to that will just, will simply be inoperable. Um, so it'll, it'll, fail, it'll, it'll fail to work and it'll have to be fixed. Um, and it won't leave room for this kind of uh, implementation error. Um, and the second kind of trend is more at the algorithm level. Um, and here we see there, there have been some moves to define some modes that are resilient against this kind of uh, this kind of error in the first place. So uh, you have constructions that uh, generate synthetic initialization vectors or, or nonces, uh, you know, based on the message itself. And so you you can't really get into a situation where uh, repeating the same nonce uh, leads to this kind of problem. Um, the drawback to that kind of scheme is that it requires you to pre-process the entire message before you can proceed. So, you know, GCM is, uh, in contrast to that, is uh, what cryptographers would call an online mode, where uh, you can process the message as it comes to you without necessarily knowing how long it is and kind of, you know, stream the ciphertext uh, out to the user. Um, then do you wanna yeah. Wrap things up. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, some conclusions from that. So, uh, TLS 1.2. Uh, I think it's really an example for a specification that you don't want to have because it, it's telling an implementer that okay, you need a nonce here, but it, it doesn't give any good guidance on how to do that. And I think we need more robust specs here. Where, uh, okay, in in many cases we can just avoid these situations by, uh, as Sean just said, in TLS 1.3 the nonce will be an implicit value, so you cannot do that wrong or else your implementation will just not work. Um, but even if you have a situation uh, like this, then you should at least give very explicit guidance on how to do this. And in this situation, the guidance would just have been, okay, always use a counter, you must use a counter, and everything else is invalid. Um, and uh, kind of the bigger picture here is um, that um, I. I have the saying that uh, whatever you can get wrong in TLS, someone will get wrong. 
So we have seen implementations, yeah, we have seen implementations that don't check for the padding, which enable the poodle attack even in versions that were not really vulnerable to it. We have seen implementations that just fail to check the Mac, and we have seen also things like implementations that would check the padding, but only some bytes of it and not all bytes of it. So, um, and what we're really lacking right now are good test tools. So what I would like to see is that I have a tool that I can run against the server and it will test all kinds of things that are possible to test on, uh, from an outside view without looking into the code. Um, and there, I mean, the, the most popular thing right now is the SSL labs test, but it is not as conclusive as one would like it to be. And there's some work done on tools. There's, what I find very promising is a tool called TLS Fuzzer, which is from uh, Hubert Cario from Red Hat. Uh, and he's also working on integrating a test for the nonce issue right now. So that will probably soon support that. Um, but yeah, that's really something that I'd like to see in the future that we have just much better testing tools. Um, yeah, and thanks for listening. And. Um, We have a GitHub repo where we, we have published the proof of concept code and also have links to our research paper and like uh, all kinds of stuff that's related to this. Also to the advisories from the vendors when there's an update and we will update this if we learn about more vendors. And uh, then also we now have an online test for this issue um, which is a bit rough. I hacked it together yesterday so um, if it doesn't work reliably, then please uh, forgive that, and I will try to make it better. Uh, but uh, you can just type in a host name there, and it will tell you what nonce values you get, and uh, tell you if that's okay. So, yeah, do you have questions? Please speak into the mics, uh, so it's in the recording. Thank um, you. Thank you, very impressive work. Uh, one quick question. Uh, the key that you try to recover, is that the session key? So, so it's actually the, the sequence number of the TLS record. So TLS itself has a, a, a notion of, uh, it's basically like, like a, uh, you know, each record you ship out has a unique sequence number with it. And it's actually already part of the authenticated data in each message. So it's, it's something that both sides of the connection are already keeping track of. So um, it makes uh, sense to use it as so a... So similar to a TCP sequence, but in within the TLS session itself. Yeah. 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 So TLS has a kind of sequence number for the TLS records. Um, but they are not using exactly the record number, but so putting some mask on it, but it's a value derived from the sequence number. Got it. So there's no need for an explicit nonce to be sent. Yeah, to exactly. Right. And they could have done that. I mean, the TLS 1.2 spec says that you can do that. And if they sh would have just said you must do that, then this wouldn't have happened. Understood. Thank you. Have you looked into to see if any IPsec vendors are doing the GCM correctly? Is your tool, and second, is your, is your tool, is TLS specific, but could that be ported over to IPsec fairly easily? So, so the scan tool or the attack, so the scan tool is TLS specific. Yeah. Um, the, the attack proof of concept is kind of split up in, into a part that's TLS specific and one that's attacking the lower level, so that could be adapted. Thanks, we have thanks. not looked at IPsec specifically. Thanks very much, that was excellent. So you had mentioned that in TLS 1.3 there's a design level mitigation for the nonce misuse problem there. Yeah. My question is, um, if you were designing a new protocol to use GCM or some other AEAD, and you solve just this one problem with GCM, you make sure you don't have this one nonce reuse problem, is that all there is wrong with GCM or are there other things you have to watch out for in GCM? <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's actually a there's actually a lot of problems with GCM. Uh, uh, as as Hannah was saying from those quotes earlier, a few people just said GCM is extremely fragile. Don't use GCM. Um, so yeah, a few different failure modes. So uh, I think Hannah mentioned its software implementations are highly susceptible to cache timing attacks. Um, there was a quote from Niels Ferguson in there that basically said, "Do not use GCM." and Kind of what he was alluding to there was an attack he developed also during the NIST's kind of request for comments, basically, um, which is basically targeting uh, usages of GCM with a truncated authentication tag. So 
Um, a lot of times people, maybe not a lot of times, but sometimes people will want to uh, basically truncate the authentication tag you know, to save bandwidth. Um, so in GCM, the authentication tag is a 128-bit value. So you can see where someone, you know, if they're uh, doing like encrypted voice or something like that, where they're sending tons of small messages, they might want to save some bandwidth by using a, a small authentication tag, you know, figuring that, you know, it's not really going to matter if the attacker is able to forge, you know, the odd message here and there, as long as most of them are okay. Uh, in GCM, this turns out to be a huge problem because uh, when you use a truncated tag, uh, you know, not only are you, you know, reducing your security level the amount you would expect, but the, uh, the attacker can also reduce it even further based on the size of the message. And every time he's successful in forging a message, he's going to learn a little bit of information about the authentication key. And after a few successful forgeries, he's going to be able to recover it entirely, you know, similar to what we saw here. Um, yeah. yeah, there there are other failure modes. It's a, it is a, you know, as they said, a, a fragile construction. Yeah. But what I mean, the thing what most people seem to be worried about are these side channel attacks, and um, I think it's just that most people right now use this implementation from Emilia Kasper and Peter Schwabe, which has been I think well reviewed. Uh, and the modern Intel CPUs have an instruction for doing this uh, ghash, uh, which also should be side channel safe. So that's kind of mitigated because everyone's using the safe code base or using the CPU instruction. Um, yeah, have, you, have you considered any of the... Um, um, Closer if, to the mic. Oh, have you considered whether there was a problem with the, the supposedly there are some, some weak keys that in, uh, TIA, or in uh, GCM where if you choose a particular session key, then that could result in an H with a, with a small um, order. Yeah, so, so what you're alluding to there is basically, I didn't go into this in too much detail in the talk, but uh, the, the setting where we're evaluating that polynomial is a, uh, what's known as a, a Galois field, and uh, this particular one has a size of uh, 2 to the 128. Um, in a field like this, uh, it's possible for some elements uh, uh, to generate what are called small subgroups, which is to say that, uh, you know, they'll only generate a few values if you multiply them by themselves, uh, like, uh, over and over again. Um, this can be a problem in GCM. If you have an extremely weak key, you know, you might be able to swap different blocks, you know, of particular coefficients in the polynomial. Um, I think, as far as I know, that this doesn't seem like a, a very practical problem to me. And I could be wrong about that. Um, but I, I think you need to, I, like, I think the chances of extremely weak keys are, are very low, and especially because in TLS the, the, the size of each record is, is capped to, like, a pretty small amount. Um, so I, I think it's probably not going to be a big issue for TLS or similar protocols. So the key that you derived uh, that can be used to authenticate uh, uh, arbitrary cipher text. Uh, how do you replace that with uh, with your own? Because uh, you don't know the session key with which that cipher text was encrypted. So, and what's the XORing? Like it's if you have the authentication key, then the rest of the cipher is like a stream cipher, and then you can like oh. if you have a known known plain text basically, which is the website, then you can X or values on it oh. and then re-authenticate it with the okay, key so you just the, got. You have to know in advance what the website is sending you yeah, and then you but can that, I mean the website is public. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the HTTP yeah. headers, they are common. So, yeah, so it, it's also worth noting you could go the other way. Like if, so our goal was to inject content by replacing a known plain text. If you were interested in some secret plain text uh, and you had some kind of error oracle, you could flip bits at random, you know, send them onto the receiver and see what comes back um, in an effort to try and divulge some of that plain text. Now, that would probably not be, well, I don't know. I, I don't know if that would be good for TLS, but 
But there, there's also even another issue that we haven't covered in our research, that if you have two blocks with the same nonce, you can XOR them and get the XORing of the two plain texts. So if you have one known plain text, you can use that to decrypt one cipher text. That, that's a basic issue of all stream ciphers, that if you use the same key twice, then the XORing of the cipher text is the XORing of the plain text. Uh, thank you for speaking with us. Um, with these, with these uh, avenues of attack in mind, what can, what can we bring to hardware vendors to push them to implement safer mechanisms in hardware, such as the way uh, Intel has added, has added cryptographic support it, in its processors? What do we need to bring to them to get them to do it right and to understand the importance to hardware, to hardware enable doing it the right way so we don't have to keep screwing up in different libraries and different operating platforms. So one thing, is, as I said, I, I would really like to see this test tool where I could tell a hardware vendor, please, uh, does your device, uh, if you, I run this test tool against your device, does it show any errors? And if yes, uh, why don't you fix them? Um, and I mean, yeah, the other thing is, um, and the question is if you want to fix GCM in a way that you have side channel safe and hardware instructions or if you just want to move on to other ciphers that you could also ask them that what they should support cha cha 20 did you investigate what the failure mode in the implementations that were repeating nonces was this just because they mem set the nonce to one two three four was it a randomness failure were they always using zero um, and if so did your scanning methodology for identifying that it hosts that were repeating nonces account for the fact that um, you may need different approaches to detect different failure modes? Um, for example, you might need a lot more requests for randomness failure versus a mem set. Um, so we didn't find any vulnerable implementation where we had access to the code. Uh, so, or even access to the software. So we could not look deeper into this. I mean, I, I said with this open SSL thing where I have kind of the assumption that it, this might be the cause. Um, but for the attack, it, it doesn't make a big difference because you're just looking for a duplicate nonce and that's like almost the same approach. Um, but, but the ones, like the example we were attacking here that was just sending a random value and then just always a zero. So, yeah. But I don't know what the flaw in the code here is because I don't have access to the software. I, I, I oh. had a slide where you take the server's ciphertext, you XOR the server's plain text, and then you XOR it again with your, your plain text. Um, are there any limitations on the length of the plain text that you want to, uh, to inject in your man in the middle attack? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So um, I said earlier that basically we can replace a known resource with uh, an arbitrary message of our choosing, but that's not quite true because uh, we're in some sense limited to the length of the message we're replacing because you know we, we need to get the, we basically use our knowledge of that plain text to recover the key stream and make our new cipher text. So while we could extend past the end of that message, we would kind of be taking shots in the dark at that point, and um, it's probably not gonna be advantageous for us as the attacker. So th that, that's actually why we went the route we did, which was basically just injecting a small amount of HTML that loaded more from elsewhere. But in the web setting, that's not really an issue, because as soon as you can inject your own JavaScript code, you, you have one, you can do whatever you want. Uh, okay, I guess if there are no more questions, uh, thanks for coming out. <laughs>